Hello everyone. This time around I want to talk about airlines and overbooking. Now this comes up as uh, kind of a result of the uh, United Airlines fiasco this week where uh, I guess a, a passenger was forcibly removed from the plane after already embarking to make room for an employee. And apparently this was done with the aid of the police. Now United eventually admitted that what they did was wrong but not before a public relations nightmare exploded all over the interwebs. Now, part of this discussion on the interwebs uh, revolved around overbooking and bumping, but this, was, this specific incident was not an example of that. Uh, that's handled in the, at the check-in desk, in the terminal, before you even get on the plane. There's no, uh, there's no removing people from the plane due to overbooking. So, while overbooking is annoying and it's bad and it shouldn't happen, this situation was way worse. But that's not what I want to talk about, the, this situation. I want to talk about the overbooking and, uh, and why it happens and what I think we can do about it to stop it happening. Okay, first of all, why does overbooking happen? Well, it's quite simple it's economically beneficial to the airline. That's the entire reason right there. The airlines know, based on their historical information and so on, that some percentage of people will, on average, not show up for any given flight. Uh, that means that they're going to be flying around with some percentage of empty seats, on average. Now, you've probably heard the refrain that empty seats cost money. I'm going to going to say right now that that's bullshit. Empty seats that have not been paid for do cost the airline money because they that's dead space that they're carrying around on the flight. They have to pay for the fuel and so on somehow. It doesn't cost as much as you think it does because they, they if they have a half full plane they can reduce the fuel load slightly and it does change the cost equation a little bit. But still, it does cost the money to be flying mostly empty planes around and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so there is that. But a seat that has been paid for does not cost the airline money. They have been paid for that seat. They are not losing money unless they're pricing their tickets too low. And if they're pricing their tickets so that they have to have 100% or more of their seats sold to break even on the flight, they're pricing their tickets wrong. Anyway... Um, so anyway, the whole empty seats cost money is bullshit. Uh, empty seats might cost profit, but they don't cost the airlines money. At least not a competently run airline. Okay. Uh, now, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm assuming that a no-show does not get their airfare refunded. And they shouldn't. They committed to uh, a seat... They should not get their money refunded if they don't show. That's why hotels, when you book, they want a credit card for security, and they say they'll charge you for the first night if you don't show. That's because they have to hold your room. They can't rent it to somebody else. They're holding your room in case you show up late. But if you don't show up, they will, they will charge you for that first night because they held that room that they might otherwise have been able to rent. It's the same idea with a seat on an airplane. If you don't show up, you should still have to pay for it. You reserved it. You booked it. You pay for it. You've taken it out of circulation. It means it can't be sold to somebody else, at least if, you're not, if they're not overbooking. So, uh, so, so how does this work, this whole overbooking thing? Well, the airlines know that, say, 10% of people won't show up for a given flight. And that means they know that they can probably get away with selling 110% of the seats in, in the plane. And then if 10% don't show up, then good, there's enough room. But... They're playing an averages game here. So it's an expected situation that 10% won't show up, but that's not the real situation. Maybe 20% don't show up this time, and 
5% don't show up the next two times or something like that. And uh, so if you've sold 110% and only 5% don't show up, now you've got too many people, they don't fit on the plane. This is when you end up with people getting upgraded to first class or something like that because of overbooking, and most people don't complain about that. Or you end up with people getting bumped from the flight, and people do complain about that, and rightfully so. Okay, so, so what do the, the airlines do? Uh, how do they figure out how many to oversell? Well, it's a cost equation. Basically, they know there's a cost if they bump somebody, and they, they, they calculate that, and it's based on the actual monetary cost of doing it, and also some of the PR hit, the cost of the PR, and the, and, and, you know, and the, the administrative uh, nightmare, and, and so on, and, and, and what have you. They know that cost, and they can amortize that over the, uh, the entire set of flights that they're overselling. Uh, you know, they, they can calculate the expected number of uh, bumps per flight, versus the expected number of no-shows and all of that. They can calculate a whole bunch of stuff and then they can work out what the cost of a bump is on average, uh, you know, across all flights, uh, the cost of bumping passengers versus the expected increase in revenue from selling extra tickets. And when selling an extra ticket increases the cost, the average cost of bumping more than the actual profit on that ticket. That's when they've oversold too much and it could because now they're going to start losing money. Their profits are going to start going down. Uh, and uh, no, they're not actually losing money, but their profits are going down. They're going to lose profit on that. So they're not going to want to sell beyond that point. Now, for safety, they'll probably set the point a little bit back from that actual break-even point because, uh, you know, the real world isn't quite so nice to behave really nice like that. So that's how they, they do that. It's all statistics and expected values, and there's a whole bunch behind it. It's about it's kind of a, about as much of a black art as uh, actuarial tables and so on for in the insurance industry. Uh, not as hard to understand as it sounds, but it, it can be quite a bit to wrap your brain around. Uh, now, that's how they they deal they do that, and and, and that's the cost equation involved. Um, so uh, now you might be thinking that this whole overselling thing isn't such a bad idea, really, because you know the airlines can sell more tickets and they fill their planes but if they do it right they don't overfill them too often and, and as a result they have more money coming in and they can potentially lower fares and compete better with the other guys and all of that jazz and maybe you have a point but think about it this way if i have a bar of gold and i sell it to joe and i sell it to fred and i only have one bar of gold and both joe and fred come to claim it. I have a problem, don't I? I'm either going to have to refund one of them the money they paid for the bar of gold, uh, or otherwise buy it back from them at the current market rate, or I'm going to have to acquire another bar of gold so that I can match both commitments. Uh, and if I fail to do something, do that, now I'm guilty of fraud. I've sold the same thing twice. And this is what the airlines are actually doing. They're selling the same seat twice. Now, I suspect they've got fine print in their, on their tickets and so on that says that they reserve the right to, to bar you access to the plane for any reason whatsoever, no matter what, at their sole discretion, and that they, they reserve the right in the event that the, uh, that, uh, the flight is uh, oversold. They will make a best effort to get you on another flight. You know legalese weasel words and so on but the entire experience of buying a ticket for a for a flight is all about picking a particular flight so they're giving you the expectation that you're going to get on a particular flight 
no matter what their weasel words say. And that's where it, I feel that it's fraud because they are giving customers the expectation that they'll get on a particular flight and most of the time that expectation is met. So there's no reason that customers would expect otherwise. And then, uh, then you get to the, the airport and you find out that you can't get on that flight because they sold your seat to somebody else. And, or you're the somebody else and you just happen to be the last person there or something like that. And this is bad. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be done. Uh, and, and this is why I think it's fraud and it shouldn't be allowed at all. Now, I have no illusions. It's not going to happen that the politicians will come along and ban it outright. That's not going to happen. One, that'd be too much of a shock to the industry all at once. Uh, there's no margins there anyway, and uh, at least if you, you hear the airlines talk. So there's enough issues there already. You don't want to have a major shock like that. Though the shock might not be as much as you think it is because I've been talking about overselling flights, but flights that don't even sell 100% are, are not going to be impacted because they're not selling out. It doesn't matter. They're, you're never going to have someone bumped from a flight that never sells out. So... You know, and, and a lot of flights don't sell 100%. So uh, this is only the flights that are popular enough that they sell more than 100% of the seats. Now, that might be the bread and butter for the airlines, though. So it, it does have a major impact for them. Now, uh, if you were to cut the overselling, odds are pretty good that airfares will go up. And they probably should. Uh, if they if they can't cover the cost of running the airline uh, without overselling tickets, then they're selling their tickets below cost. So obviously, uh, if the cost has to go up, it should go up. Air travelers should pay the real cost of flying. Now, uh, odds are also pretty good that fewer people will travel if the price goes up. That's fine. Uh, and that could lead to further price increases, and th there would probably be an equilibrium point there. But it would be a shock to the airline industry, and that would definitely be a potential issue. Uh, so you don't want to do this overnight. But remember that cost equation I was talking about. There's another way to affect the behavior of the airlines. Instead of doing an outright ban, what you can do is not change the status quo too much, but instead change the compensation that's owed to the passenger in the event that they get bumped. Uh, you could start with something simple, like uh, require that uh, if, if a passenger is bumped from the, uh, their expected flight, that the airline must refund the entire total amount the customer paid to be on that flight, including all taxes, fees, surcharges, airfares, and anything else that was charged. And this must be done in cash, not as airline credit. And the airline cannot claim it as either a business expense or an input tax credit for tax purposes. Make it a real cost. So if you do that, and also require on top of that that the airline get the passenger to their destination by any means necessary as fast as actually possible. And that means that it might be pay, the airline paying full retail last minute airfare to a competitor to do it. And again, don't allow that to be a deductible expense for tax purposes. Don't allow it to be an income or an input tax credit for tax purposes. Make it a real hard cost. Okay, you do that and I'll bet you the number of bumps drops substantially instantly because they will back off to a safer point in their cost equation. Uh, and they won't have to back off much because, the, uh, you, because of the way the percentages and so on work out. But they'll back off a little bit and start overselling a bit less. Then you can introduce 
penalties for for it happening, and you can ramp those up over time. Uh, and then uh, you could you could have uh, compens you have minimum compensation on top of the uh, refund paid to the customer. Uh, you, you obviously have to, the airline has to cover all incidental costs while the customer's waiting, things like that. And, uh, you know, you have, you have all of that jazz. Now, they have the, inf the infrastructure and so on to deal with this sort of thing. It's exactly the same thing they do for distressed passengers, which is uh, where weather or some other event prevents them from getting to their destination. You know, you're stuck in the airport because it snowed in or something like that. Distressed passengers. It's the same mechanisms they already use for dealing with them, uh, but maybe you don't allow it to be tax deductible um, because it's a penalty instead of a dealing with an unexpected event. Okay, uh, then you, uh, you you have a minimum compensation on top of the uh, the refunds, and that minimum compensation is extended the longer the delay. Now, uh, it should be possible for the airline and the customer to come to an accommodation where uh, the customer agrees that, hey, yeah, everything's good, but there must be a level playing field there and no bullying. So the customer could refuse the compensation, obviously. Uh, but there, you have to make sure there's no bullying. So... Uh, you know, it it uh, it gets to be a, it, it's a tough balance there, and then you can slowly ramp up the the compensation amounts. Uh, you can add punitive amounts, uh, multiples of the airfare uh, refund, for instance, and then over time you you slowly ramp up the cost of bumping a passenger, and eventually you get it to the point where the airlines are maybe bumping one passenger in a month instead of several a day, right? And then maybe you can let the status quo stand, or at that point, you can outright ban overselling. Um, but, it, you know, eventually you get it to the point where the average flight is not oversold. And then at that point, you can safely ban overselling. But it shouldn't be allowed in the first place. It should have been prosecuted as fraud when it was first done. Uh, but it wasn't. And, uh, or maybe it was and then they lobbied and got the laws changed or whatever the situation. But it shouldn't have been allowed from the start. But it is. And now we really need to stop allowing it. There's a lot of things like this that we should stop allowing because they're dubious on uh, morality or they're certain or they're uh, probably fraudulent or, or what have you. Now you might be wondering why is this why is is this a problem uh, when you consider the way say bus tickets work? Well uh, because you're not guaranteed to get on a particular bus when you buy a bus ticket. Uh, well yeah that's that's a different different uh, kettle of fish altogether. Most bus tickets are sold as a source to destination uh, fare, but it's valid for any, uh, any bus going in that path. So that means that, uh, uh, that you can uh, buy a, oh, and at any time, any day, you know, it might expire, but it's valid over a range. And, uh, you know, that means that you get to the bus station, you have your ticket, you can get on the bus, or you can wait for another bus. Uh, and the ticket itself isn't specifically, like the whole purchasing experience isn't necessarily geared around selecting a particular uh, schedule. And that, uh, that's the difference. The whole airline experience is geared around selecting a particular flight. And you don't do that with a bus ticket. So it's a different experience altogether. It's a different expected situation, expected outcome. Uh, but still, bus companies will still make the best effort to get people where they want to go as quickly as possible. It's good customer service. 
but there's limits on what they can do. If they have too many people show up, well, the people might have to wait. You know, that's just the way it works. But again, they're not selling you a ticket for a specific uh, specific bus. And although sometimes the tickets are, uh, especially if you have a reserve seat or something, but they'll always stay, be for a reserve seat only on the first leg of the trip. So, and so or on the first bus. So, yeah, that's that's the that's really the, the the size of it. There, it's not the same thing as the airlines. Now, if the airlines actually operated the way bus lines do, and they could, if they really wanted to, then there wouldn't be an issue with this. They could sell as many tickets as they want for destination, for uh, source to destination. And then you show up and you get on the plane that you fit on. If you don't fit, you don't get on the plane. Uh, but because there's so much hassle involved in dealing with flying, they don't do it that way because it's, uh, uh, well, they're, well, the logistics are, are problematic. But if they did it that way, then it wouldn't matter. They could sell as many tickets as they wanted. And they just have to eventually get the people to their destination. Uh, but the selling point of air travel is that it's fast and uh, it gets you there on time. Uh, so that type of model doesn't work as well uh, in, in that case. Anyway, uh, basically, uh, while I think we should just completely outlaw overselling uh, seats and, and airplanes. Uh, I am realistic enough to recognize that's not likely to happen and that we need to attack it from the other end of the cost equation. And even if we never do stop the overselling completely, if we can reduce the magnitude of it, we'll substantially improve customer or traveler experiences. And that would certainly be beneficial as well. And you know, by increasing the cost of bumping somebody, uh, you can actually impact the behavior of the airlines very substantially. Now, uh, anything you do is going to trigger a lot of fighting and teeth gnashing and uh, probably court challenges from the airlines. Uh, because, you know, they don't want to change their business models, right? But if you bring it in slowly enough, they can adapt and you won't put anybody out of business. At least not anybody that wasn't going to go out of business anyway at some point. Anyway, that's really uh, what I wanted to, to say. Uh, we should ban overselling, but if we're not going to, we need to increase the cost of doing it. We need to make it harder for the airlines to justify it. And if we can do that, we'll certainly reduce the magnitude of it. And that will be a net improvement at the very least. Anyway, uh, that's all on this topic. Uh, if you want to be notified of future videos, you know, make sure to subscribe and turn on the, uh, the notifications with that uh, silly bell icon. And uh, if you liked the video, or you didn't like it, leave a like or a dislike, whatever you see fit. You know, it won't hurt my feelings any one way or the other. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.